Uh, just to give uh, some examples of how we use the molecular MRD results for clinical decision making. Um, just a few uh, initial points. In terms of comparing it with monitoring for CML, it is definitely more complicated. Um, sometimes uh, we uh, will be looking for numerical um, MRD results, uh, as Nikki alluded to with the threshold. Sometimes we'll be looking for log reduction. Sometimes we'll be looking for positive and negative, and that all varies depending on the specific clinical situation. The second thing to say is um, the use of molecular MRD and MR is not really as fixed as in CML, because there's data emerging all the time from um, new trials and also the treatments under evolution. Um, so for example, um, there's very little is known about molecular MRD under a non-intensive phenetoclax-based treatment. Um, nevertheless, it is used um, quite extensively and increasingly so for clinical decision-making. So this talk is really just to give a flavor of how that's done rather than give too many specific rules. But I would like to make the point that as MRD is now rolling out uh, into more and more labs um, to try and meet the capacity, it's really increasingly important to be able to standardize the measurement so that the sample sent to any of these labs will give the same result. Because if not, it implies that different and therefore potentially inappropriate clinical decisions will be made. So I really welcome the effort of Stuart and colleagues in order to bring this group together, because I think it can be really important in, in terms of um, avoiding um, harm to patients based on um, inaccurate lab, lab measurements. So broadly, there are two ways that molecular MRD measurements are used in um, AML. The first is applying these at early time points after one or two courses of chemotherapy to try and fine tune the risk stratification. So the risk stratification will be generally based on cytogenetics, a molecular profile. And then in this situation, MRD is uh, fed in to refine that risk stratification is particularly valuable there, therefore in the intermediate risk patients where decisions about the transplant, particularly in first remission are particularly controversial. And actually increasingly the MRD, um, at the early time points used to make that decision. And I'll show you some examples of that. Second um, uh, way this is applied in practice uh, is by applying sequential MRD monitoring during treatment, but also during follow-up after fin finishing treatment in order that uh, relapse can be diagnosed before it's clinically apparent and preemptive treatment will be applied. So I'm gonna show you examples of uh, both of these and how they work and uh, very briefly summarize the evidence surrounding these just by following a few real life clinical cases um, and just to take you through those. And the first one of those is shown here. And these are all taken from cases that we've monitored in our lab. Uh, it's a 64 year old uh, female newly diagnosed Dinovo AML with a normal carrier type, an NPM1, uh, insertion, uh, no FLIP3 mutation, and entered in the AML19 clinical trial. And after the first course of induction chemotherapy, she's in complete remission. And this is the MRD profile that uh, Nicola and Katya have elegantly introduced. In other words, the blood and bone marrow is shown here, the blood in blue, the bone marrow in red on a log scale. The hollow points, again, indicating a negative result. And why does that move? Well, it's because it's plotted at the maximum sensitivity that that sample would afford it based on the RNA quality as assessed by a housekeeping gene. Anyway, what does this tell us clinically? Well, you can see that the patient has had uh, two courses or three courses of induction chemotherapy, but after the second one, so the second point, both the blood and the bone marrow are negative. So what do we do with that information? Well, actually this information for NPM patients in the UK and I think increasingly in other countries is now used to decide whether the patient should have a transplant or not in first remission. It's really important because a transplant is quite a life-changing procedure. It carries a risk of death associated with it between 10 and 20%. But for those patients who survive the procedure, they, they're at risk of long-term health conditions such as growth versus host disease. It's also extremely costly about £200,000 per procedure. So we really want to focus this where it's absolutely needed. Um, now, all of which is to say, um, th these are the results from the AML17 study, um, comparing patients who tested MRD positive with those who tested MRD negative in the peripheral blood after the second cycle of chemotherapy in that trial protocol. And what you can see is the MRD positive patients on red 
had a very high incidence of relapse, 83%, and a low, a low overall survival, 25% in three years. So this would um, justify um, giving the patient an upfront bone marrow transplant. On the other hand, patients who tested MRD negative had actually a low incidence of relapse um, of 28% at three years, although important to note, this is low, but it's not zero. So a significant proportion of these patients will relapse. They'll relapse in the first two years. Um, but however, it ought to be possible to pick them up by applying sequential MRD monitoring. So as a rule now, um, these patients are not selected for transplant and they're given consolidation chemotherapy. What's the evidence that transplant will benefit those patients? There's not any direct evidence at the moment. There's indirect evidence from the French Alpha study. French Alpha study also showed that MRD status after two courses of chemotherapy is prognostically extremely informative. Actually, they defined MRD negativity in their study as a four log reduction uh, in the peripheral blood rather than positive versus negative. So you can see how uh, different uh, MRD metrics um, uh, are, becoming, are becoming important. Now, what you see here is the patients with the favorable um, MRD response with the greater than four log on the blue and the orange lines. So those ones that had uh, a transplant are shown in mustard color, they appear to do, if anything, slightly worse than the ones that didn't have a transplant on the blue colour, not significant. On the other hand, when we look at the poor MRD responders, that's the grey and the red colour, um, the ones that had a transplant on the red colour do reasonably well compared to the ones that didn't on the grey colour. So this is non-randomised, indirect evidence that the trans, but, but really probably the best evidence we have that the transplant in this situation is going to improve the outcome. This patient didn't have a um, tr transplant first remission, but instead they had sequential monitoring in order to de detect the approximately 20 to 30 percent of patients that would relapse. And what you can see here is approximately 12 months from diagnosis, uh, sequential monitoring sample tested MRD positive. As my previous colleagues have said, we would never take any action on a single result. This is therefore repeated urgently. And you can see that it's a gain positive with an increase in the transcript levels, fulfilling the European Leukemia Network defin definition of a molecular relapse. And you might see behind that that the um, peripheral blood sample is also positive. So this patient has a molecular relapse. We know for sure that this patient's going to relapse clinically without any further intervention. So generally, practice now is moving towards intervening at this stage uh, rather than waiting for a frank relapse. And there's a number of different interventions. This particular patient actually had a chemotherapy intervention, which we tried to move away from, um, but that was um, one of the randomizations in the clinical trial protocol. So they received this chemotherapy called CPXP51, and the MRD actually had gone down slightly on regeneration following that. Mm -hmm. Next question is, can this patient go for transplant now, or is the level too high? So this is an example where I show you where we need positive versus negative, where we need log reductions, but this is where we need absolute copy numbers in, in terms of copy numbers per, per ABLE. Because data from the AMR17 study have defined thresholds um, of MRD positivity <clears throat> of 200 copies per 10 to 5 ABLE blood in the blood, 1,000 copies in the bone marrow, which can reliably split um, patients into two groups, one with a very good outcome with a very poor outcome. Uh, importantly, this only applies to FLT3 ITD negative patients, uh, those with FLT3 ITD with any MRD level or high risk. So this patient had 56 copies, so below the 1000, so able to go for transplant. Transplanted, gratifyingly, MRD negative post-transplant. But of course, if the patients relapse once, they can definitely do that again. And indeed they did. This is actually now three years from diagnosis. Um, it's one of these cases where they never seem to be able to shake it off. Uh, but you can see again, the bone marrow has turned positive on surveillance marrows, never acts on a single one. There's a repeat done, the gain positives increase. It's an ELN molecular relapse. So in a post-transplant setting, there's advantages. You can then uh, modify immunosuppression, give down a lymphocyte infusion, which is often effective. It wasn't in this case. You can see there's progressively increasing levels. So this is an example where you would need to know absolute copy numbers to, in order to compare 
the one, one with the previous one to see if there's any progression. And you'd also want to know the kind of log reduction between the samples to give you an idea of the pace of the disease. And you can see this collation is clearly not responding. It's gone up by two logs. Treatment tag is changed for Nitoclax azacitidine. It clears the MRD spectacularly well um, after a, a couple of cycles. Second example is quite similar. So 59 year old male with de novo AML with a normal karyotype, an NPM mutation, but this time he has a FLT3 co-mutation with ITDs. So she's got two ITDs, 27, 45 bases in length, the lead, total elite ratio of 0.38. Uh, not entered into trial, but a treated off study with DA, myelotarg, and incomplete remission after course one. Uh, the report looks slightly different because this is generated by Catcher's lab, but shows the same thing, peripheral blood negative after two courses of chemotherapy. Bone marrow is positive, but uh, that's not informative in terms of the prognosis. So the patient undergoes consolidation chemotherapy, sequential MRT monitoring. What you can see here is again, the year out from diagnosis is a positive sample. So Catcher, Nikki have both talked to you through what happens in that situation. Since you repeat it, still positive, we get repeat sample, repeat samples positive, increase in the level, then we know that the patient's going to relapse without further intervention. I mentioned that this patient had FLIP3 ITD mutation at diagnosis. So in this case, the patient was able to be actually salvaged with a FLIP3 inhibitor rather than chemotherapy, underwent, achieved MRD negativity, underwent to transplant. So that's NPM. I'm going to just talk about a couple of cases we've called binding factor leukemias now, because as previous speakers have alluded to, the way this is used is slightly different. And what underlies that difference is this phenomenon where at the end of treatment, a lot of patients actually have continuous low level expression of the um, fusion transcripts, and it just sticks there for ages, for years, and it doesn't necessarily imply relapse. And um, we need to, so this is a situation where we really need to know the absolute copy numbers. First, to be able to be sure that they are below the, the thresholds that have been defined in a number of prospective trials, but also that we know that they're not increasing significantly comparing samples with each other. So this is an example of a patient treated in our hospital, a 53 year old man with inversion 16, negative for FLT3, NPM or indeed any other mutations on his gene panel and treated in the ML19 trial, where he received lag IDA and myelotarg. So we didn't tend to do anything actually with the um, initial uh, MRD res results in core binding factor leukemias. They can identify a population that's slightly higher risk of relapse uh, than others, but that's not really informative in general in terms of planning a transplant as these are overall favorable risk patients. We tend to take more notice of is the levels at the end of treatment. So this patient's now had three courses of intensive chemotherapy. You can see that the level is 308 copies in the blood, and in the bone marrow, and it's negative in the blood. So what does that mean? So Nikki mentioned the AML15 study by John Yin and colleagues, where they've done this analysis looking at the end of treatment samples and to find these thresholds of a for 821, it's 100 copies in the blood and 500 in the marrow. Um, below those thresholds, a patient has a very low chance of relapse. So you definitely don't want to be going ahead and um, intervening in that patient with a transplant because you'll just make their outcome worse. In version 16, which is what this patient had to relevant thresholds, are 10 copies in the blood and 50 in the bone marrow. If the patient's MRD positive below those levels, you certainly wouldn't want to do anything. Um, but what if they're above them, like this patient is, I showed you, they've got 308 copies. So they may be on this trajectory, actually, where there's a 100% chance of relapse, if that's true. Is there any evidence that we can intervene and improve the outcome? Again, only um, relatively indirect evidence um, from a Chinese study, which used a rather different treatment protocol than we're familiar with, and actually only for 821 leukemia. So in this study, which is published in 2013. Um, patients underwent uh, four courses of intensive chemotherapy, and then they were stratified according to whether or not they had had a three log reduction in the bone marrow, which is the threshold that they found predicted prognosis best of all. Those who had a three log um, 
were allocated to receive consolidation chemotherapy, far more cycles than we would ever give in the UK. Um, those who had not achieved the three log went for allograft bone marrow transplant. But however, there were patients that didn't follow the protocol, so the ones that were allocated to chemo who went on, who went off and decided to insist on having a transplant, and there were ones that were allocated as transplant who refused to transplant and had chemotherapy. So non-randomized uh, data. Let's look at the ones on the top panel here. These are the ones that had the three log reduction. The ones that had the consolidation chemotherapy had 100% overall survival compared to 76 from the ones that had a transplant, suggesting this might be, as I mentioned, that you could actually do these patients harm by intervening with a transplant. On the other hand, these are the ones that didn't have a very good MRD response. The ones that followed the protocol or had a transplant had a better outcome than those that refused the transplant. Again, this is non-randomized, highly biased, but that's the data we have. <clears throat> Anyway, what did we do in this case? Well, actually, this is slightly off piece, but uh, the patient wasn't a great transplant candidate. Um, we're not that keen on transplants in general in my hospital. So um, we, we, we know that patients with core binding factor leukemia respond very well to myelotarg. We gave additional cycle of chemotherapy with a further dose of myelotarg. The level went down to 31 copies, which is below the threshold, and subsequently became negative, and the patient remains negative. I would just like to give you a couple of examples um, of the rarer types of fusion, how that can be used. Of course, the data here is even more sparse um, than as I mentioned so far, but it actually still could be useful um, for clinical decision making, especially in very difficult cases. So this is an example of a patient with, again, 44 year old female with de novo AML with a normal carrier type. However, this time the patient's NPM negative, but she's got the flip free IGD. In these cases, we do tend to we do tend to screen them for cryptic fusion transcripts because we do tend to find uh, quite a few of them harbor uh, cytogenetically cryptic rearrangements that produce inflamed fusions that can be monitored. And these patients are high risk of relapse, so it's worth monitoring them. Um, and this patient went to AML19, and our process in that study was to screen all the patients for DECAN and NUP98 by PCR um, for the reason that if we identify them, first of all, we'll, we'll like pull out the patients with the worst prognosis. So you can see here these NUP98 patients are particularly terribly badly, but more importantly, we may be able to um, track the patient's disease with the molecular assay, allowing that to be fine-tuned and hopefully being able to overcome some aspects of the poor prognosis. And this patient had NUP98. So how was that information useful to the clinicians? Well, you can see here the trial treatment was allocated, resulted in initial reduction in the transcript burden, which is shown here again on a log scale in the blood and the bone marrow. But then the response appears to be lost, and then there's a progression between the third and the second and the third cycle here. Remarkably, the patient remained in hematological remission and underwent bone marrow transplant. But due to the very alarming MRD profile, a patient had an early MRD assessment post-transplant on, immediately on engraftment. And unsurprisingly, this was positive and repeated again urgently. And again, there's been a log increase. There's been a, um, so this patient's at extremely high risk of early post-transplant relapse, which would be highly, uh, extremely unlikely to survive from if this patient has a frank relapse. Um, but knowing that the MRD profile is heading in the wrong direction, the clinicians were then able to go in, start the patient on a fit free inhibitor, as well as weaning the immunosuppression and a number of other maneuvers in order to regain control. And this patient had a good outcome. And then finally, Nikki mentioned this um, technique um, to screen for a broader range of cryptic fusions using RNA sequencing. And this is increasingly useful and particularly useful, as Nikki mentioned, a paediatric population where uh, RNA sequencing studies have shown a, a high prevalence of uh, fusion genes in paediatric and young adult AML, and a lot of these are cytogenetically cryptic. It's important to know about them because they influence prognosis, but also as an added benefit, they can be used to track disease. So a 10-year-old boy with a normal carrier type, de novo AML, who's negative for NPM and CBP alpha has a flip free ITD. So obviously, first step in the protocol is to screen them for these common cryptic fusions but they're negative. So as Nikki has elegantly shown you, 
uh, we're now putting these patients through uh, RNA sequencing panel called um, RNA, uh, sorry, Illumina True Site, and an Ariba Fusion Core bioinformatic pipeline, uh, able to uh, really nicely pull out um, fusion junction transcripts on a base pair level, allowing us to design a patient specific assay. In in a clinically relevant time frame, i.e., before the patient recovers from the first cycle of chemotherapy, which typically takes four weeks. So that's what we did in this case, and uh, we're able to return these results in real time to the clinicians and actually show them that this patient has had a terrible response with less than a one log reduction in transcripts in the bone marrow, and then increase, if anything, after cycle two. It's not, couldn't really think of anything else to do. It's not responding to chemotherapy. So they did take the patient to transplant. Surprisingly achieving MRD negativity early on, but are well aware of the poor early response. They were forearmed and kept a very close eye on the MRD. And they had already pre-made the applications for split three inhibitor serafinib, which you have to get special permission for children to use it post-transplant. And they're also able to harvest donor lymphocytes from the donor. They were to deploy both of those together to be able to get this patient into a molecular remission, avoiding a post-transplant relapse in this patient, which would have been catastrophic and likely fatal. So that's the end of my talk. And I'd really like to thank, um, obviously, all the lab members, and in particular, Katya and Nikki, for their great talks, and all of the patients who have partic participated in the UK studies, as well as our funding bodies. Thank you.